put on a happy face, right? <laughs> so we're in the middle of a series called Disruptive Joy. This series is all about looking at uh, what are some things from within Scripture that will we, we'll literally, no matter what we're in the middle of, we can disrupt our reality and bring joy into that situation or experience God actually imposing his joy upon us, I would say, uh, throughout this series. And so we, what we've talked about is what are these, what are these things? Because as we all experience, there are things in our life that we can just kind of be feeling down, but it's amazing how quickly something can like, oh, just bring you up. Like I was, I had kind of like a down moment uh, mid, mid-week or I was kind of bummed for something. And my wife showed me this video that she had taken of my son uh, crawling under our, our kitchen table. Let me just show it to you. Like, and I just like, <laughs> now that's, that's hilarious. And that's like, I play it again. It's only like eight seconds, but like, it's hard not to laugh at that and be like, oh, it's okay. Everything will be okay. And, and quite frankly, there are these moments in your life where you're just like, you feel like, oh, I'm being pressed to the limit. And then all of a sudden, when the Lord actually releases his joy into your heart, you'll be like, oh, it's okay. We're going to make it. And we've talked about how the word of God is supposed to produce joy. That's the finale whenever you encounter God's word and you read God's word. And if you're not uh, experiencing joy at the finale of reading God's word, you're doing it incorrectly. (laughs) Or you're actually getting probably derailed along the path of what God wants to produce in the word in your life. And so if you missed that, uh, please go back and listen to that. Because I had so many people afterwards, they're like, I do. I always get derailed right at the spot. Here's where the enemy knocks me off track from ever getting to the finale, which is joy when I read God's word. Uh, Last week, we talked about joy in salvation, how when we stare at the cross and how God continually brings, uh, can can save us on a daily basis from walking in the flesh versus walking in the spirit. There's joy in that. And today we're going to be talking about joy in his presence, joy in his presence. And what we're going to be talking about this, it's kind of a weird term, but I'll kind of unpack it a little bit. Um, We're going to be talking about practicing his presence. What does it mean to practice his presence? Or there are some things that we can do to practice to get into his presence. Because this is what 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 27 says. It says, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and what? Joy are in his dwelling place, or it can be presence. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Uh, the, the Hebrew word that gets translated as dwelling place is the Hebrew word uh, makom. My high school daughter and I were talking yesterday about how do you remember these Hebrew words, and, and she said, well, it's easy. You can't take makom because you're bald. And <laughs> so when you want to remember about God's dwelling place, just remember that you probably have my comb, and I don't need it anymore. But this, I know, this is like pastor kids, dumb lives. Okay, so we have some weird things that we talk about. But I love, I love this Hebrew word because of Macomb, because it's talk, it says this, it, it means his space, his standing place, it's, it's his dwelling place, or, or ready for this, it's his room. I love that. It's like, imagine like, oh, I get to hang out in God's room with him. Guess what? When you get into God's room, guess what you will experience? Strength and joy. You get in his room and chill with him, guess what you're going to experience? Strength and joy. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. So we got to figure out how do I get in his room? And here's now the, the, really the dead giveaway or the big thing. Are you ready? God's room is not somewhere up there. God's room is here. Uh, last month I talked a little bit about the difference between God's omnipresence and manifest presence. Let me just review really quick. God's omnipresence, this is the theological term that we use to describe that God is at all places at all times. So Psalm chapter uh, 139 talks about uh, if, how God knit me together in my mother's womb. If I go to the highest heights, you are there. If I go to the lowest depths, you are there. There's no place that I can go to escape your presence. This is the reality that he's all at all places. He sees you everywhere. He's there, okay? So so there's the, uh, his omnipresence, but then there's the manifest presence of God. What's the difference? The manifest presence is this. It, it simply means this. It's his presence being made clear and, and obvious in the eye or mind, meaning I'm becoming a, aware of his hereness. He's here. I'm now becoming aware of it. And I'm, it's clear what he's doing here. 
I'm, I'm now aware. Like if you've ever been in a worship song, maybe singing about grace or something like that, and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. It's like, it's like the, his grace lands on you in a palatable, heavy way. What happened? He was already here. What happened? You became aware of his manifest presence. Now all of a sudden his grace and his presence was like abundantly clear to you. You became aware of what he was already up to in the room. Are you tracking? So, th so this is what we want, the question we want to ask is, how do we become aware then of his manifest presence? How can I experience the manifest presence of his omnipresence more often? Because I want the manifest presence. I want to be aware of what he's up to in this space because he's already here. Henry Blackaby, he talked about in his book, Experiencing God, that was kind of the premise of the book. He talked about, look for God's presence and join him in what he's up to. Look for what he's already doing and join him in what he's up to. What I want to do is I want to just kind of look at three different things that will set you up to experience his presence or the manifest presence of God. And in each one of these passages, I, what I want to do is I want to look at um, basically that it establishes that there's joy found in his presence. Then I want to look at the context around the person who wrote it and what they were doing that brought them into the joy in his presence, okay? So the first passage that we're, that we're going to look at is this first Chronicles passage. And the first thing is, that will lead us there is a heart that seeks. Everyone says, say heart. A heart that seeks. Say seeks. Heart that seeks. Okay, so the first Chronicles passage we've already established, he says, joy or strength and joy are in his macomb. It's in his presence. Okay, so what got him there? Well, one of the things that got him there was a heart that seek after him, that would seek after him. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 10, this is what it says. Glory is his holy, or glory is his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord, what? Rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. So hearts that seek him will rejoice. Now here's, this is really a, a cool thing that we see here because the word that gets translated as rejoice is this uh, Hebrew word. I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I didn't come up with a cool word to way to remember it. Um, like my, I don't know, my shoe. But it was, uh, the that was a bad joke. Just pity laugh, okay? Come on. Help me out. <laughs> the, the heart that, is, uh, that seeks him rejoices. The Hebrew word that gets translated out is rejoice. Some uh, words are what we do, and other words are what he does. This is a word that it's, it's done to us. It happens to us. So it's actually, it's to be made glad. So here's what it means. Meaning, we seek him, he makes our hearts glad. Are you tracking? It's, it's this reality of sometimes we go, I got to seek him and I got to be glad in because my heart has got to rejoice in this moment. That's not what it means. It's we seek him, he makes our heart glad. It's, it's you do your part, which is just seeking him. He'll do his part, which is he'll make your heart rejoice. We assert seeking him, he asserts joy upon us. Does this make sense? When I was in Alaska, I was uh, on a missions trip there for about a month, and one day, I was in high school at the time, and high schoolers were there, yes, to serve, but high schoolers also usually go with a side motive of having fun. And uh, so one day, we were uh, up kind of in a national park there, and we saw a mountain that led on up to a glacier, and we're like, let's go on up there, and let's climb that glacier. So we started climbing this glacier. We knew it would take us a couple hours to get to the top, and uh, when we got to the top of the glacier, it was kind of dusk. Now, Alaska during the summertime, the sun just kind of goes in a circle in the sky. It really never sets. It kind of comes low. Um, and so it was coming low. It was starting to head down. And I turned around. I saw this most amazing picturesque moment that I'd ever seen in my mouth or mine or in my, my, my life. There's mountains on one side. There's the ocean off in the background. The sun is coming down. It just looked unbelievable. And in that moment, I just said, oh, God. That's it. I was like, oh, God. And I was just like, you are good. You, wow, like, wow. And as my heart just started to say, I just am blown away. I want to I know you. In that moment, the manifest presence of God became more palatable to me than I, probably in any other time in my life, where it's like his, his 
Spirit, it felt like it just like poured upon me. I had one of the most sweet, one of the sweetest God moments I've ever had where the Lord just met me right there. Now, here's the deal. He was already there omnipresence. What happened is I became aware of his manifest presence, of, of the sweetness and the glory of God. And he said, let me show you my glory. And it was like, and in this, I was like, I'm a high school guy, tough high school. And I'm weeping like a baby up there because it, it just overjoyed. And, and here's the deal. Sometimes this idea of like seeking the Lord, it feels like, well, it feels ambiguous. Like, what does it mean for me to seek the heart? You know, my heart seek after him. And I, the best way I would describe it is sometimes it's kind of like climbing a mountain. You don't always know exactly how you're going to get there. Just start taking a step. Like, just start climbing. Just, just start. And what you'll find is if I do my part, God will do his part. I start seeking, he'll assert his presence and reveal joy uh, in that situation. And so what, what could just start seeking? What's that first step? And for some of you, it might be like, just started reading my Bible. I'm just going to start. I'm going to start praying. I'm just going to start. I, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm going to start crying out to him the best I know how. I'm just going to start. And it's just, just take a step. I, I feel like some of you, you just need to start taking a step up the mountain. And as you take a step up the mountain, guess what? You're going to discover God's presence there and an overwhelming sense of joy is going to overtake you there. So first thing, hearts that seek. Second thing, eyes that are fixed, okay? Hearts that seek, second, eyes that are fixed. Let me go to Psalm chapter 16. He's referring to joy in his presence. Let me establish once again that the guy finds joy in his presence. It's verse 11, it says this, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with what? Joy in your what? Presence, okay? With eternal pleasure at your right hand. So the psalmist is experiencing joy in his presence. What got him there? Okay, it's, I'm going to make the argument. It's eyes that are fixed. Now, the front side of this, this psalm, he actually is going to contrast or compare and contrast two different emotions. One emotion is sorrow, and the other emotion is joy. Okay, how many of you want sorrow? Didn't think so. How many of you want joy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what brings you to sorrow? What brings you to joy in his presence? Okay, verse 4, he starts to reveal, here's what will lead you to sorrow. It's eyes that are fixed or chasing after Small gods, many idols. Check it out in verse 4. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. It actually can be translated, well, sorrow will, will fill them. I will not pour out libations of blood. That was a blood sacrifice that sometimes people would pour out on an altar to a false god. Uh, or take up their names on my lips. Hop down to verse 8. Instead, this is what he will do. I will keep my eyes open always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It literally can be translated, my eyes will be fixed on him. So he's keeping his eyes fixed on God. Now that doesn't have to be literally what you're looking at. It, it can be a word picture, um, of, of course, of the things of this world that our hearts are so often drawn to, or that so often receive the attention and the affection of our hearts. Are you alive? Okay, good. It's the things that our eyes get fixed on that uh, draw our attention and our affection. How many of you guys are watching the Olympics right now? I love the Olympics. The Olympics are great. Uh, it's like it's one time, my kids make fun of me though when I'm like watching figure skating and they're like, Dad, why are you watching figure skating? I'm like, it's okay, it's the Olympics. <sighs> You know, it's, it's the one time of the year that it's okay that, I'm, it's, that I can do this. And, and so I'm, I'm excited about the Olympics. I love watching it. I want to talk, tell you about a one Olympic athlete. Um, he's not a winter Olympic athlete. He's a summer Olympic athlete. Uh, but his name was uh, Matt uh, Emmons. And he's, he's, obviously, you can see he's well-decorated in that left picture. Lots of Olympic medals, gold, silver, and bronze. But the picture on the right tells a different story. The picture on the right actually tells uh, the story of, in the 2004 Athens uh, Olympics, um, this is a moment when he kissed a gold medal goodbye. See, he was set up to win the gold. He's a sharpshooter. He's super good at what he does. He, had, uh, he was leading the pack, and he's heading into the final round, three shots at the target, and he wins the gold. He takes aim. He shoots three shots, three bullseyes. The only problem is he shot at the wrong target. Ended up in eighth place. Did the same thing in the 2008 Olympics. 
Now, obviously, he wins a lot, but he also loses some. Why? Because sometimes he aims correctly and sometimes he aims incorrectly. It's all what his eye is fixed on. His eye is true every time. But when it's at the right target, he wins joy. (laughs) When it's at the wrong target, sorrow. And the same is true for us. When our eyes are fixed on the wrong target in life, you lose. Sorrow comes when our eyes are fixed on the wrong things. And if we're honest, many of us, our eyes get drawn to lots of things besides what God is doing in our lives. Many gods, many idols can be things like stuff, promotions, relationships, power, influence, children, your spouse, and the list goes on and on. Now, now, please track with me. Those things that I listed are not bad in and of themselves, right? Like stuff, promotions, your kid, your spouse, those are not bad things. They, w- w- what can happen is when our attention and our affection of those things trump what God is up to and we make those things the God in our life over what he's up to, we actually set ourselves up for sorrow in those things because we're attaching our hearts to something that is created, to something that is finite. See, uh, the, the eternal soul hole, I would describe it as, can only be filled by something that is eternal. That is him. Check out what Psalm chapter 107 verse 9 says. For the, he satisfies the longing, what? Soul. It's, it's this internal, eternal thing. The hungry soul he fills with good things. See, only God himself, the eternal one, can fill an eternal hole. And only God can satisfy the longing soul. But what we sometimes do is we chase after, we fix our eyes on things of this world, which will ultimately lead you to sorrow. You want to know a good prayer? You want a good prayer? No? Okay, I'll move on. No, you want a good prayer? This is a dangerous prayer, but it's a good prayer. Trust me. It's this one. Once again, this will disrupt some of you guys, but in a good way. God, give me discontent with the things of this world that are capturing my attention that will lead me to sorrow. God, give me a discontent for the things of this world that currently capture my attention that will ultimately lead me to sorrow. Reminds me of that old hymn that says, may the things of this world grow strangely dim. That's what we're asking God to do. God, would you help the things that currently of this world are, are sparkly, glittery, ooh, I like it. Would you help those things to grow dim in my eyes that my affection, my attention are not drawn to those over what you're up to? I think what we should be doing is asking, God, what are you up to? What would you like me to be a part of? Now, if you're honest, uh, and I'm not going to do a show of hands here because you will feel like the most unspiritual person in the room, but you probably can relate. If you're honest, how many of you are afraid to ask God, what would, what would you want me to fix my eyes on? Because you're afraid that, that he's going to tell you, fix your eyes on something that you think is boring. If you're honest, there's a lot of people who are like, I'm afraid to ask God what what I should not be fixing my eyes on, what I should be fixing my eyes on, because I think he's probably going to tell me to do something boring, because all of God's things are probably boring. And I'm telling you that it's actually not true. Like, you're afraid. Some of you are like, if I ask God what I should be doing, he'll probably tell me I can't, that I shouldn't be uh, coaching my kid's sports team. And I like doing that. He's going to have me teach Sunday school. Which, if, if you hung out with my little three-year-old who's crawling, that's like awesome fun, okay? So please, that's, that's really exciting. But, but we sometimes think, well, that'll be boring. I'm going to argue God is probably actually not going to ask you to uh, abandon that thing over there, like your, your kid's sports team and coaching. What he'll probably do is he'll probably say, no, I want you to do that. What I want you to do is become aware of my manifest presence in that thing. Like, I want you to coach. I just want you to be aware of what I'm up to there. How about you partner with me in my presence in that thing? Are, are you aware? Are we tracking? He's probably not going to say, oh, stop doing it. I want you to do all these things that you're not interested in. No, he's probably going to say, do everything that you're interested in. How about you just partner with me as opposed to your agenda? Hop on my agenda in that thing. That's a good thing. That's right. Come on. All right. Hearts that seek, eyes that are fixed, Lips that request, third one, lips that request. Psalm chapter 21, verse six. Surely you've granted him unended blessing and made him glad with the joy of your presence. Joy of your presence. Okay, so what in the world got the psalmist into the joy of his presence? 
Check it out, verse two through four. You've granted him his heart's desire and you have not withheld the what? The requests of his lips. You came to greet him with rich blessings and you placed a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked you for life and you gave it to him. See, what happens is the psalmist is saying, God, I need, I'm requesting I need your life. I need your victory. And the Lord gives it to him, and he says, let me reveal my presence, and then you're going to enjoy the joy in my presence as you're making a request for me to be engaged in your life. Uh, as a result of requesting God to go with him, he gives him the victory, and he gets it. James chapter 4, verse 2, it says this, you have not because you ask not. Sometimes my kids will I'll, I'll come home after shopping or something like that, and they'll say, Dad, did you buy ice cream? You're like, it's winter time. No, I didn't buy ice cream. And they're like, oh, Dad, why didn't you buy ice cream? And I look at them, I'm like, because you didn't ask me. Like, if you would have asked me, I actually wouldn't have minded buying some ice cream. Like, that's not a big deal, but you didn't ask me. I think sometimes we do this with God. We're like, God, why didn't you do this? God, why aren't you showing up? He's like, you didn't ask. Like, if you asked, I actually don't have a problem showing up in the midst of that thing. You just need to ask. Notice the psalmist, he's saying, I'm going to ask. I'm going to request. I'm going to declare what I need of you. And God's like, all right, I'll show up. I'll reveal my presence. And what I'm talking about here is the position of using your words or your requests in faith to declare his needed presence in your situation, in your lives. We talk pretty often about the power of declaration and the power of words here. Scripture says that there is life and death, the power of life and death in your words and what you declare. Lisa, you know, just even in wor earlier in worship, he was, she was leading us saying, listen, I think some of you need to declare, God, you are good. This is in spite of what you're seeing or feeling right now, in faith, I'm going to say, God, I need to see your goodness in what I'm in the middle of. And that's activating our faith. Are you aware when you say something, a lot of times all you're doing is saying, all right, God, I believe I'm declaring that I'm putting my faith in you over what I can handle or what I'm going to do in this situation. So what are some ways that you could request or declare that will invoke his presence? Any of you heading into a meeting this week that could be difficult? Some of you are like, or you're like my boss is in the room. I don't want them to know. I think they're difficult. Uh, here's a good prayer. That you could pray before that, God, would you go before me into this meeting and prepare the hearts uh, of those present? Have you ever been in a meeting where it's like, I, I prayed about it in advance, and I was expecting it to go one way, and instead the person was like really gracious, totally didn't respond the way I expected them to respond? Some of us have experienced Some of you are like, I've never experienced it. Why, you, why haven't you experienced it? You haven't asked. That's why. It's time for you to ask, God, I need your presence to go in uh, before me into this room, prepare the hearts of the people there. How, how about this prayer? God, uh, I need your presence to bring conviction over my heart when I'm tempted. How many of you are going to be tempted this week? Probably most all of us. You know, in great prayer, God, may I be aware of your manifest presence in the middle of temptation. You want to know why? It's kind of hard to sin when you feel like God's right beside you. Like, God, get away. You're too, too close. Because you're aware, and that's a good thing. You're like, oh, yeah, you're here. Well, we can make it through this. Strength and joy are in your macomb, in your presence. God, I need your presence to fill my home with peace. God, I need your presence to provide strength and courage today. See, if you want joy in his presence, it's time for you to invite his presence into your moments throughout the day. You know, for me, I know a lot of people are not people. They're not people people. I am. I like being with people. But most of all, I love being with my wife. She's like my favorite, which is how it should be. I love you, babe. And, uh, you know, the other week we were like going to pick up, my, I think, my son from someone's house late at night. And we were kind of looking at one another like, who's going to go? Who's going to make the drive? And uh, she looked at me and she's like, you'll go, right? I'm in my jammies. I was like, sure. I was like, you want to come along? She's like, Why? I was like, because I like being with you. I know, I'm sweet. <laughs> Bonus points. Um, and while driving, it's not like we had this like magical conversation. I just am happy being with her. There's joy in her presence. Now, that's a finite relationship. How much sweeter is an infinite relationship with a holy, perfect, forever God 
who just wants to be with you and in his presence is courage, strength, joy. Some of you need to go for a little drive with Jesus. Seriously. You just need to hop in the car and say, God, you and I, we're just going to go for a little drive. And all he's looking for is a heart that would seek him. That's you just making your best effort to say, God, I don't know what it looks like for me to climb this mountain, but I'm going to take a step toward you. God, would you reveal what my eyes are fixed on right now that are elevating uh, these things of this world above you? Or God, what are you up to in the things that I'm already involved in? Reveal your manifest presence, what you want me to do. Or how about just lips that would request that while you're on the drive, you say, God, I need you. I need you, God, in my relationship with my spouse. I need you in my parenting. God, I need you in my workplace. God, I need you. I'm just going to make this request, and you want to know what? Just as quickly as I see that little video of my son, and I, you know, go, I go from a moment of like, uh, to a moment of, it's going to be okay, and, and joy, same thing. God, in that very moment while you're on a drive with him, will say, will release his presence, and you're going to experience the joy of the Lord. A little drive with the Lord. Let's close here in prayer. Maybe some of you want to do some business with the Lord right now. It can be a really simple prayer like this. Maybe it just starts with climbing, climbing this mountain, a heart that would seek him. For some of you, if you're honest, you would say, I've never taken kind of an assertive step toward God. And yet it starts with just something in your heart where you're saying, God, I don't know everything that it looks like, but I just know I'm going to take a step toward you. You promise in Scripture Hearts that seek rejoice, and you're the one who places the joy in the heart. So I'll do my part, which is taking a step toward you. You do your part, which is reveal your presence and bring me joy. How about our eyes? Heavenly Father, maybe right now in this room, in this moment, you start revealing some things that we've uh, elevated above you. Our attention and our affection are fixed on these things as opposed to fixed on you. We've thought about our agenda, coaching the sports team or in the things we enjoy, as opposed to what are you up to and what would it look like for us to join you in those activities. For some of us, Lord, it's, it's, it's our lips actually making a request. We've just never thought to to really ask. And some of us right now are just going to say, God, I need your presence in my relationship. I need your presence in my workplace. I need your presence in a decision that I'm going to make. I need your presence in a form of wisdom to make the right call. I need your presence to sustain me with courage and strength. I need your presence to bring me joy. In your dwelling place, there is joy. And you are everywhere, so Lord, may we become aware of your manifest presence, what you're up to in our lives, because you are up to something, and we want to join you in it. We want to experience the joy in it. We declare this all in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. We would love to continue praying with you. If you have any prayer needs, people are always going into surgeries, or they've got people that are burnt, you know, burdens upon their heart. We want to partner with you in prayer. we got a prayer team back here. We'd love to pray with you. Swing by there before you leave. Uh, Go to the, the serve track during the next hour. Otherwise, be blessed. Have a great, great Sunday. Thanks for being with us.